So before we get started today, just a little bit of context on what we're going to be talking about. Um, this is the fourth of the LPELC webinars, which has been um, participated in by members of the I Am Responsible team, which I mentioned a little bit earlier. Um, and you can find out more about our group. It's a, a nationwide team of extension um, and research professionals working specifically on the topic of antimicrobial resistance within the food um, production chain. And you can find more about us um, at our team's website, imrproject.com, or search for I Am Responsible through the LPLC um, website. Uh, we also host a spring um, online class called um, I Antimicrobial Resistance from a One Health Perspective. And if you'd like to know more about um, how you could get involved in that class through your institution, uh, please feel free to email me. I'm mzelt2 at unl.edu. Um, for any of you who have not been able to be on one of our webinars, we talked about antimicrobial resistance, just a little bit of kind of brief information. Antimicrobial resistance, antibiotic resistance, or I'm calling it AMR here for antimicrobial resistance, is naturally occurring genetic mutation in a microbe. Then there's all kinds of microbes. We're usually specifically concerned with bacteria, but it can occur in, in any kind of microbe. And while that, those naturally occurring genetic mutations are usually among only a minuscule part of the population and not much of a concern, our use of antimicrobials, whether it's antibiotics or antivirals or any kind, will select for them. And um, we're particularly concerned about that in for that selection um, for resistance against antimicrobials that we use as medicine, like antibiotics, because the result is a reduced effect of the medicine in the overall population of the microbe. And that can have major um, public health um, repercussions in both humans and in animals. But the, the problem is, of course, that because the um, resistance is naturally occurring, it can happen anywhere. And so as people are trying to make decisions on how to best manage this um, in the years to come, there's a lot of information that we are trying to learn to um, better inform those decisions by, by risk management um, managers and by communicators on the issue of antimicrobial resistance. Um, and some of those important questions are um, how much antimicrobial resistance or antibiotics are we finding in um, any of the, the places where it can occur, humans, animals, or the environment? What are the possible pathways for the antibiotics or the antimicrobial resistant bacteria to reach a human or an animal and cause potential health um, uh, harm? And uh, what are the interventions that are possible and how effective they are? And then what are the actual health effects if that antimicrobial resistant does reach the human or animal where they could cause harm? And all of these questions, I mean, there's a lot of uh, research ongoing to answer them within human and animal health, but a lot less so on the environment. So today's webinar, we're going to be learning about specifically antimicrobial resistance in the environment and try to understand some of those questions to build a better understanding of the risk context um, for what problem antimicrobial resistance that we find in the environment could have on for human and animal health. Um, and today's speakers um, are experts in AMR in the environment. We have um, Dr. Shannon Bartelt Hunt, who is a professor and uh, head of the Department of Environmental and Civil Engineering at the University of Nebraska, and Dr. Michelle Soper, who is a professor at the Department of Agriculture and Biological Systems Engineering at Iowa State University, and they're going to tell you a little bit more about their research, so I will leave that to them. Okay, great. So we are really happy, um, both Michelle and I are very happy to speak with you today on some of our past research, focusing on different aspects of um, antimic antimicrobial resistance and, and how it moves through the environment and also how it can be mitigated. So first, a quick introduction for myself. Um, so as Mara mentioned, I'm the department chair in civil and environmental engineering at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Um, I've been working on various aspects of contaminant fate and transport for about um, 20 years. 
Um, my focus in AMR really comes from a focus on the antibiotics, which can be one of the um, pressures to cause antimicrobial resistance in the environment. Um, and then I'm going to turn it over to my co-presenter. Thanks, Shannon, and welcome, everyone. My name is Michelle Soupier, and I am a professor in the Department of Ag and Biosystems Engineering at Iowa State University. Um, similar to Shannon, my research has focused on monitoring and also some modeling of different emerging contaminants in agroecosystems. So how did the impact of agricultural practices, um, including livestock management, cropping systems, how do those impact water quality? And um, from the AMR perspective, most of my work has really focused on uh, the presence of resistant bacteria as well as genes. So now I'll turn it back over to you, Shannon. So first to give a little bit of background about antimicrobials. Um, so antimicrobials, which is a more um, generic term or antibiotics, um, which specifically could focus on uh, bacteria. Um, first, the con our consumption of these compounds has increased quite a bit in the past uh, 15 to 20 years. So we're using more and more antibiotics. Uh, we use them obviously to treat human diseases. We also use them in um, animal agriculture. Uh, whether we're using them for people or for animals, um, antibiotics are not completely metabolized, meaning that some fraction of the antibiotic um, is excreted from either the human or the animal in its biologically active form. Uh, so they're released into either urine or, or fecal material. And then oftentimes when we're thinking about animal wastes, we can apply those wastes to land as a beneficial um, soil conditioner, as a replacement for chemical fertilizers. Um, and then with municipal waste, with human waste, they're you know, treated in a wastewater treatment plant, but those plants are not always designed to remove these antibiotic compounds. And so what we find is that we have these antibiotics entering the environment either through municipal wastewater treatment effluents or after land application of, of animal manures. So kind of thinking then about how those antibiotics, if they're released from either a human or an animal and our you know pictures on the left kind of humorously um, describe those potential um, modes of consumption, where do they go from that point? So with respect to, again, human waste, the top pathway, um, our wastes are treated at municipal wastewater treatment plants. Um, antibiotics can be, um, hydrophobic and can uh, concentrate in the solids. So oftentimes we may find that the biosolids, which are produced from the sewage sludges could be a source of antibiotics. We can also find a fraction of those antibiotics remaining in the effluent, the liquid portion uh, that's discharged from the plant. On the animal side, uh, we know antibiotics can be excreted into um, solid waste or ag wastewater. Um, those can be applied to cropland either by reusing the wastewater or through um, use of manure as a fertilizer source. And th these are all ways that humans could be potentially exposed to antibiotics either through uh, recreation in surface waters if, if uh, runoff has occurred um, from croplands containing manures um, or wastewater reuse. Um, that can be one source if we're applying um, solid manures to crops, there could be a potential um, source of uptake. So there's just various ways that um, humans may be exposed to antibiotics that are originating from the environment. And just more generally, where are antibiotics coming from? This is a figure that really shows all of the ways that contaminants can enter the environment, but there's a few um, of the pathways that are specifically relevant for antibiotics. So if we look at the POTWs, uh, the treatment facilities, wastewater treatment facilities, surface runoff, um, potentially a little bit in urban runoff, these are really the, the main sources. And then I think what this figure also shows is that once these compounds are in the environment, um, they can either be transported through the aquifer down toward groundwater, or there are also a lot of processes that can take place within the surface water body. And so these antibiotics could be attached to sediment, they could be in the water column, 
there could be uptake by organisms, aquatic organisms. And so it's really a complex um, um, kind of picture of what happens to these antibiotics after they're released into the environment. And so in terms of occurrence in the environment, there have been many, many studies looking at the occurrence of antibiotics. And the take home message, what we really find is we do find antibiotics routinely in wastes, both human waste and animal waste. They're found in soil, dust, and then our waters, groundwater and surface water, as well as wastewater. And so the, um, we find these antibiotics and um, these antibiotics can lead to proliferation of antimicrobial resistance. And so here you can see an example how we can have the development of antibiotic resistance. So uh, in the upper left-hand corner is the antibiotic, which is often used in, um, in the, the many ways, which Shannon just explained. Uh, the photo here shows a confined animal feeding operation, swine production. And as she mentioned, those, ana those antibiotics can move through the animal system and still be biologically active in the waste uh, treatment system. So that manure is often applied to our cropping systems. And from there, we want to better understand the environmental transport. And the development of the antimicrobial resistant organisms can occur at many different points along the environmental pathways. So in the manure storage system, we have the concentrated antibiotics that have come through um, the animals. And of course, a lot of different bacteria are also present in those systems, which leads to the conditions where um, antimicrobial resistance can develop. It may be present naturally, but then the selective pressure from those antibiotics may lead to uh, additional proliferation of that resistance. And it's also possible that once the manure is applied to the soil, again, that manure is coming in contact with the existing soil microbiome. And here we could see the transfer of those resistant genes to the native uh, microbial community that exists within the soil. And then the surface, though the water can move. So if we have a precipitation event, that water can move off those agricultural fields through surface runoff, or it can also infiltrate into the soil um, and move into groundwater. Or the picture in the middle shows a tile drain outlet. And so tile drain is a really common practice in parts of the upper Midwest. Um, if you would come to Iowa 200 years ago, you would see a prairie wetland system. And so in order to have the agriculturally productive land that we have, we need to artificially lower uh, that water table. And so that does provide another pathway for uh, bacteria, other contaminants to move into those tile lines and then quickly move off site in, in that direct conduit. And so through all of the these different um, environmental compartments, we do have potential for the resistance to develop within that native community. And then when we do have pathogens and potentially human pathogenic or animal pathogenic bacteria, um, there's the potential for that resistance to develop in these pathogens and create uh, what we would call these uh, drug resistant superbugs. And so antibiotics can lead to antimicrobial resistance, which we'll refer to as AMR um, moving forward. Okay, and so this also shows, so, you know, some of our concerns with the development of um, antimicrobial resistance. Uh, the figure on the left shows you know, the number of antibiotics that have been developed with time. And we can see that there's a negative trend. Um, less and less new classes of antibiotics are being discovered. Whereas on the other hand, we know that the resistance of bacteria has been increasing with time. So we have two trends that are working against each other. Um, and so we really need to start addressing um, antimicrobial re resistance. And one of the pathways that is least explored is through the um, environment. And so, um, and then this slide is showing us how resistance can develop. And it's kind of unique when we think about monitoring antimicrobial resistance in the environment. It's not like there's a single a point that we can always detect and know that there is a potential concern with the presence of antimicrobial resistant organisms. Um, and so this is showing an example of the many different ways in which an organism can respond 
to antimicrobial resistant cells are very smart and they developed different mechanisms to resist and protect themselves from the antibiotics that they may be exposed to um, in these different environmental compartments. So I won't go through all of these, but just some examples are um, there may be a surface site modification so that the um, antibiotic is no longer able to penetrate into the cell. There can be a response such as an efflux pump, which would be a mechanism where the antibiotic would be transported out of the cell. And so with these many different ways that bacteria have developed resistance to the antibiotics, there's many different genes that are responsible for these um, behaviors within the cell. And because of this, looking for um, an indicator of antimicrobial resistance can be really challenging.